Today, I'm very excited to introduce one of our own chief residents. Um, Dr. Matt Wagar is from Minnesota. He attended college at the University of Wisconsin um, and studied biology and global health. He then attended medical school at the University of Minnesota, where he was elected to um, the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society and received the President's Student Leadership and Service Award for Community Engagement. He is currently a resident here uh, at the University of Wisconsin and serves as our education chief resident. And he will be remaining in the department next year to complete his fellowship in gynecologic oncology. Please welcome Dr. Wegar this morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Bizzuto for the introduction. All right, let's just get everything situated here. Okay. so. For those who don't know me, uh, like Dr. Bizzuto said, my name is Matt Wagger. I am one of the boy PGY4s who's not John or Daniel. Um, so thank you for inviting me to present my grand rounds today discussing access to risk-reducing gynecologic surgery. And in preparing for this presentation, I came across this quote from JFK, which felt particularly timely not only because I was able to come up with a snappy title, but it allowed me to sort of reflect on the efforts that patients and often the public have to go through to keep themselves safe and healthy now more than ever. And so in doing so, I was spurred to detail the evidence for risk-reducing surgery and how we as women's healthcare professionals can act as facilitators and, and champions of preventative surgery. So, okay. So I nor the planning committee have any relevant financial disclosures. Can you imagine if I did, that would be so wild. How does this advance? Perfect. Okay. Um, so these are my learning objectives. Um, you may note this talk will skew sort of heavily towards the prevention of epithelial ovarian cancers, but we will touch on some preventative interventions for a handful of other conditions in passing. So during this session, we will examine some biologic theories and epidemiologic evidence for risk-reducing gynecologic surgery. We'll discuss current recommendations for risk-reducing gynecologic surgery for background and high-risk women. We'll describe some barriers to risk-reducing gynecologic surgery at the individual, institutional, and national levels. And we'll compare trends in risk reduction in the peripartum on an interval basis and at the time of benign gynecologic surgery. And finally, discuss targets for intervention to increase access and utilization of risk-reducing gynecologic surgeries as well. All right, so to begin, ovarian cancer is the most lethal malignancy of the female reproductive tract with an estimated 14,000 deaths annually in the United States alone. Given lack of effective screening strategies, ovarian cancer tends to present at an advanced stage with an overall poor survival. And advances in the understanding of tumor pathogenesis in the last two decades have led to the development of risk-reducing surgical interventions as a means of ovarian cancer prevention. So where does ovarian cancer come from? The rationale for risk-reducing surgery boils down to this. So as many of us know, ovarian cancer is a heterogeneous group of cancer diagnoses, including different histologic patterns, molecular profiles, and patterns of disease. Embryologically, the ovary originates from several different primordial structures. The germinal epithelium is derived from the salomic epithelium. Ovarian cortical tissue comes from the subsalomic mesoderm and germ cells from the yolk sac endoderm. Whereas in contrast, the remainder of the genital tract arises from the malarian ducts and the urogenital sinus. So that's all to say, it's not surprising that many different types of cancer are linked to this structure and its various cell types, given the complexity of ovarian origin. Historically, fallopian tube and primary peritoneal cancers have been examined and considered under the umbrella term of ovarian carcinoma, given similar microscopic appearance and patterns of spread. However, both histologically and molecularly, epithelial ovarian cancers largely re resemble mullerian structures, implicating their suspected involvement in the pathogenesis of this condition. So because these cancers appear and behave similarly, but are known to originate from separate structures, Identifying a unifying precursor lesion had remained elusive. So over the last few decades, several theories have emerged trying to explain the origins of ovarian cancer. However, none have been able to completely unify the development of this group of cancers. 
So for example, the incessant ovulation theory emerged in the 70s, suggesting that a person's risk of ovarian carcinoma increases without experiencing breaks in ovulation. Fatala et al. posited that excessive disruption of the ovarian germinal epithelium led to metaplasia and dysplastic transformation. And this was then supported by findings suggesting that OCP use and pregnancy were protective against ovarian cancer. However, this theory doesn't hold up across all epidemiologic examples, such as women with PCOS who by definition are oligo or anovulatory are known to be at an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Similarly, progesterone only formations of contraception are also known to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer despite the fact that they don't typically inhibit ovulation. So then another theory emerged that came to be known as the gonadotropin hypothesis, which theorized that overstimulation of the ovarian epithelium via FSH and LH leads to proliferation and malignant transformation. This fit nicely because pregnant women and women taking oral contraceptives maintain lower levels of gonadotropins and could explain why nulliparous women, women with PCOS and other forms of primary infertility experience increased risks of ovarian cancer. Despite this, levels of FSH and LH don't correlate with risk of disease and animal studies do not support the malignant potential of cells exposed to superphysiologic levels of these hormones. And so this theory also wasn't a perfect fit. So it became clear as our molecular understanding of ovarian cancer advanced that no one unifying theory or precursor lesion would explain all forms of ovarian cancer. Endometriosis emerged as a predominant precursor to endometrioid and clear cell ovarian carcinoma. And in the early 2000s, the search for precursor to high-grade serous ovarian cancer continued. So in 2001, a group of Dutch researchers led by Jurgen Pike identified dysplastic and hyperplastic lesions in the distal ends of fallopian tubes of women undergoing risk-reducing BSO for BRCA mutations or a family history of ovarian cancer. And hypersectioning protocols then emerged and careful analysis of fallopian tubes obtained from high-risk women in the years to follow demonstrated early tubal malignancies often confined to just the distal fallopian tube. Fallopian tube lesions were noted to have high precipitated concentrations of TP53 in their cytoplasm without frank dysplasia, giving rise to the term P53 signature, which was felt to be a marker of oxidative stress and DNA damage. More interestingly, serous tubal intraepithelial intra carcinomas were described as a form of carcinoma in situ, with the exact pattern of P53 mutations as occult ovarian malignancies discovered at the time of risk-reducing BSO. So in 2010, Dr. Robert Kerman, a pathologist from Johns Hopkins, proposed a unifying theory, suggesting that serous ovarian carcinoma began as a dysplastic lesions in the dis distal fallopian tube, and through direct extension or ovarian cyst inclusion, developed into ovarian cancer as we know it. So here you can see a timeline of these events as they unfolded over the last two decades. This figure is taken from a gray journal article from 2019. And it's the kind of thing that makes me upset to look at because it's very pretty and I'm upset I didn't think about it before they did. So notably as evidence linking stick lesions to the pathogenesis of serous ovarian carcinoma grew, so did a paradigm shift away from screening and towards primary prevention. Within the same decade, evidence suggesting that tubal ligation was protective against ovarian carcinoma emerged at an epidemiologic level and coupled with the newly emerging tubal hypothesis, support for salpingectomy as a means of primary prevention grew. So arguably a component of this rapid adoption of the tubal hypothesis can be traced back to Dr. Pike and his group out of the Netherlands who proposed this same theory in a letter to the editor in 2003, seven years before the unifying theory was published by Dr. Kerman's group. But that is none of my business. And so shortly after the formalization of the tubal hypothesis, um, various societies and organizations started to adopt stances on opportunistic salpingectomy. Bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for a long time had been considered a reasonable prophylactic measure for women with genetic predisposition to ovarian cancer, but it wasn't until the late 2000s that the concept of reducing risk of cancer for women with average background risk emerged. 
So many major women's health societies, including the Society of Gynecologic Oncology of Canada, SGO and ACOG have all adopted statements encouraging the consideration of salpingectomy as a form of permanent contraception or at the time of benign hysterectomy. Notably, only the GOC provides a definitive recommendation against BSO in premenopausal women for the indication of baseline risk reduction. And given lack of prospective oncopreventative data and overall understanding of the long-term hormonal effects of salpingectomy, a strong evidence-based recommendation is likely decades away pending European and North American randomized trial maturity. So here you can see these recommendations that I've laid out in table form, you know, more or so as a reference um, and just for comparison between these three specific entities. So in present day, all women presenting for any type of benign abdominal pelvic surgery should be counseled on and at least offered risk-reducing salpingectomy if they've completed childbearing. However, the question of how to factor in oophorectomy into this decision still looms. So in 2005, a study from Dr. William Parker, who's now at the University of California, San Diego, suggested that using a Markov model, oophorectomy prior to the age of 65 for benign indications led to an increased mortality secondary to cardiovascular risk elevation. So thus expert consensus at that time rapidly changed to reflect this finding. However, criticisms of this model demonstrated a lack of reproducibility given input estimates and more contemporary data has already begun to refute this sort of absolute cutoff that was proposed. In any case, for those desiring or considering oophorectomy, thorough counseling and discussion regarding cardiovascular, psychosocial, and anticipated menopausal side effects should be undertaken for anyone considering this procedure. So how then do we approach average risk women in regards to prophylactic oophorectomy? And evidence to support ovarian functions, protective cardiovascular effects really dates back to the 80s. However, analysis of the nurse's health study delineated the boundaries of oophorectomy more closely. The nurse's health study is one of the largest prospective cohorts of women aimed at collecting a plethora of data on female nurses in a prospective manner to better understand patterns of chronic disease. So in the late 2000s, Dr. Parker also published a series of papers examining the effects of benign oophorectomy on ovarian and breast cancer risk reduction in relation to other chronic conditions and all-cause mortality based on the nurse's health cohort. So in their initial analysis in 2009, they concluded that compared with ovarian conservation, bilateral oophorectomy for benign disease is associated with a decreased risk of breast and ovarian cancer, but an increased risk of all-cause mortality fatal and non-fatal coronary heart disease and lung cancer. And in no analysis or age group was oophorectomy found to be associated with an increased survival. So then their group followed this study up with another report in 2013 on the long-term effects of oophorectomy versus ovarian conservation. Again, concluding bilateral oophorectomy is associated with increased mortality and at no age is oophorectomy associated with increased survival. However, of the more than 30,000 women included in this analysis, only 48 had died from ovarian cancer, and four of those had undergone oophorectomy. They report a hazard ratio of 0.06 for ovarian cancer following oophorectomy when compared to ovarian conservation. So it's interesting their conclusions heavily weigh towards ovarian conservation for benign indications, given they don't actually report survival as an outcome. The data presented provides raw mortality numbers without mention of temporal relationships between oophorectomy and age of death, meaning we can't infer a time from surgery to a time when a participant died. Additionally, some of the main drivers of their argument, such as cardiovascular disease and stroke, are barely statistically significant when examined in multivariate analysis. So seen here are hazard ratios for all cause deaths and cause specific mortality. And notably, you'll see that in the 50 years and older age groups, none of the hazard ratios meet statistical significance and all the confidence intervals include one signifying that lack. 
But if you look at the confidence intervals even closer, the all comer statistics weigh heavily towards the less than 50 cohort, which makes sense being that almost all the mortality data presented here falls within that age range. So yes, these findings are supported, but a lack of survival benefit outside of that age range cannot really be inferred. So what can we do with that then? Well, this data would suggest that oophorectomy does prevent ovarian cancer and mortality appears to only rise if performed in women before the age of 50. So for many practitioners, these age ranges are interpreted as surrogates for menopausal status. And certainly many practitioners offer prophylactic oophorectomy once a person has gone through menopause at the time of pelvic surgery. And that being said, this hasn't been explicitly studied or validated and the decision continues to remain individualized at this point. So then how do we do with high risk populations? You know, evidence promoting the benefit of risk-reducing bilateral salpingo oophorectomy predates the tubal hypothesis by decades and is much more robust regarding its ovarian cancer risk-reducing effects. Quoted as, up, quoted as upwards of 70 to 80% um, of risk reduction, depending on the study. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network recommends risk-reducing BSO for women with BRCA1 and 2 pathogenic mutations between the ages of 35 and 40 and 40 and 45 respectively. So owing to the on average eight to 10 year delay in the onset of BRCA2 associated cancers, for many patients without an identifiable heritable mutation, the decision to pursue risk reducing BSO is individualized based on family history and historical onset of disease, but for many can be considered beginning at the age of 35. In general, for patients at risk for hereditary ovarian and breast cancer syndromes, hysterectomy is not currently recommended. Although recently there have been some associations drawn between BRCA1 positive patients and serious uterine cancers, leading to an update that specific individuals with concerns for familial serious uterine cancer may be considered for risk-reducing hysterectomy at the time of BSO. And how do we make decisions about less common but still known pathogenic mutations? So in general, all patients should still be considered for salpingectomy should they desire. However, NCCN suggests that when a genetic predisposition places an individual at a risk greater than the background, risk reducing BSO can be considered. So given that the background risk of ovarian cancer, depending on where you look, is anywhere from one to 2%, NCCN proposes a 3% cutoff risk for a risk reducing surgical intervention based on a pathogenic mutation or a variant of undetermined significance with a strong family history. So here I've compiled a table of less common mutations, um, but still you know, routinely encountered that have been linked to or associated with ovarian cancer. And while it's not necessary for the purpose of this discussion to detail this extensively, it is worth noting that outside of the BARD1 domain, of which there really is still insufficient evidence to routinely support risk-reducing BSO, all gene products that are associated with the BRCA complex or homologous recombination warrant consideration of BSO based on observed penetrance of epithelial ovarian cancer in these populations. So unfortunately, some knowledge of translational genetics might be helpful here, and I'm very sorry about it. And so I did say we would touch on some risk reduction for cancers outside of ovarian. So he hears me fulfilling that promise. Um, so several described disorders carry an elevated lifetime risk for uterine cancer, notably Cowden syndrome, Lee Fraumini, and Lynch syndrome. And given variable penetrance for these mutations, family history and individual motivations, as well as comorbidities are essential for determining optimal timing of risk reduction and hysterectomy. While well, risk-reducing BSO is not indicated in Cowden syndrome, it again can be considered for those with Lee Fraumini and Lynch. So then considering the rapid emergence of national recommendations, it's not surprising that the uptake of salpingectomy has taken off in the last decade. And indeed, following these landmark publications, um, you know, in 2010, 2011, salpingectomy quickly gained momentum at the time of benign hysterectomy, coupled by the knowledge that tubal retention has often been associated with hydrosalpinx and 
symptoms requiring reoperation. The proportion of benign hysterectomies completed with salpingectomy rose sharply following SGO practice advisories that have been issued in 2013 and ACOG committee opinions published in 2015. And so you can see that here again from a nice paper out of USC in the Gray Journal. So how then has this practice changed across different surgical settings? So while well, salpingectomy was rapidly integrated into laparoscopic surgery at the time of benign hysterectomy, introduction into other areas like the peripartum period, including at the time of cesarean or immediately postpartum has been much slower given perceived risks of this procedure in the setting of gravid anatomy. And perceived is sort of the key word here. Um, so even if you look at our own institutional data, the introduction of salpingectomy in the postpartum period didn't really begin until shortly after the SGO clinical practice statement in 2013, reaching the majority of postpartum procedures at the end of 2017. And so despite its uptake in academic practice, the majority of tubal procedures performed for permanent contraception continue to be tubal ligation or occlusive procedures. And many women qualifying for genetic screening and high risk reducing BSO don't have this completed in a timely manner. So then how does the integration of gynecologic surgery into evidence-based practice compare to other risk-reducing surgical interventions? How do we stand relative to other specialties? And so perhaps the most obvious comparison becomes how do we do relative to risk-reducing mastectomy for breast cancer prevention, which brings me to a dramatic non sequitur, Academy Award winner, Angelina Jolie. So in 2013, Academy Award and three-time Golden Globe winner, Angelina Jolie, published an expose in the New York Times detailing her experience as someone living with a BRCA1 mutation and her decision to undergo risk-reducing mastectomy. This brought massive attention to the subject of BRCA testing and access to genetic counseling and referrals. And while mastectomy rates over time have largely been constant owed to the variable incidence of breast cancer between the third and seventh decades of life, a surge in BRCA and high-risk breast cancer referrals occurred across the globe following this announcement. So then in the advent of genetic testing, a steady increase and then relative plateau occurred in referrals placed. Then this rapidly rose in 2013 following Jolie's announcement shown here. And this is data that's taken from a referral center um, that was prospectively collected in the United Kingdom uh, sort of around the late 2000s um, and shortly after her announcement. So despite the rise in BRCA testing that occurred as a result of her publication, the rate of detected mutations in the presenting populations then remained relatively constant, which was good. It suggested that the highest risk groups that were sort of reached by her statements and continued to present with an increase in people presenting, but not a change in the proportion of people diagnosed. So the rate of risk-reducing mastectomies though, following her expose remained constant, again, suggesting sort of a bottleneck effect with this genetic testing component, not necessarily access to the surgery, but access to genetic testing and genetic screening itself. So then in light of this realization, what barriers can we identify that prevent risk reduction for patients regarding ovarian cancer? And research examining these questions groups many of these obstacles into patient, physician, and institutional factors. So for many patients seeking out tubal surgeries, the motivation is not necessarily focused on oncoprevention, but rather contraception. A lack of knowledge of the potential risk reduction profile of salpingectomy then contributes to missed opportunities for opportunistic surgery at the time of other benign abdominal surgery. And for many, even a pap smear can be considered too invasive. So then the idea of undergoing even minimally invasive surgery from our perspective for cancer prevention can seem way over the top. And so not only do patients need knowledge to empower their decisions, but they need to be able to access, be it geographically or, or via their insurance network, surgeons who are knowledgeable and skilled in the performance and integration of these procedures. Um, and then there's the problem of eugenics in this country. And this could be an entire discussion in and of itself, but for many, the the threat of eugenics and course of reproductive practices is still a recent memory and, and a very real threat to well-being. 
And at the intersection of forced sterilization and, and oncopreventative justice is a PhD thesis. So I won't really get into this in great detail, but to say that given the shared trauma of contemporary eugenics in the United States, the thought of removal of a reproductive organ for cancer prevention to many seems dubious sort of at best. So from a surgeon's perspective, a, a lack of translational ability to complete these risk-reducing salpingectomies or BSOs, you know, across a variety of surgical settings, including a minimally invasive, you know, at the time of laparotomy or C-section or in the peripartum may preclude them from offering this procedure. And similarly, given the perception of risk, particularly in the peripartum, as I mentioned, many surgeons don't feel the benefits of salpingectomy outweigh the risks. And as I mentioned, Practitioners may not bring the same intention to the operating room that patients do, leading to discrepancies in the delivery of these procedures and, and expectations. So why is the uptake of salpingectomy in the peripartum so behind the interval or the laparoscopic setting? And a delivery admission is, is known to be an optimal time for the receipt of salpingectomy as a form of, as a form of desired permanent contraception. 10% of hospital deliveries are accompanied by sterilization procedures and gravid uterine anatomy easily facilitates access to the adnexa. Reported concerns regarding this include perceived hemorrhage risk, the competency of surgical technique, increased complication rates and increased operative times have not borne out in the literature. And if anything, salpingectomy at the time of cesarean and immediate postpartum vagin following vaginal deliveries has similar outcomes. For many, cost concerns regarding completion of this procedure exist specifically owed to the utilization of energy devices to complete peripartum salpingectomy. However, theoretical modeling continues to demonstrate cost effectiveness of salpingectomy in the peripartum for ovarian cancer risk reduction when compared to standard tubal ligation methods. And the argument can be made for the ongoing utilization of energy devices if it facilitates greater dissemination of postpartum salpingectomy. So notably, reimbursement issues exist regarding preventative surgeries. And while this in general is covered for the indication of permanent contraception, many federal insurance plans will not cover sterilization procedures without adequate or archaic documentation not found in other disciplines practicing informed consent. And a lot of that has to do with, again, our history of course of sterilization and taking advantage of vulnerable populations to study these procedures, even in, recently in the last 20 years. Um, however, these barriers exist and continue to contribute to differentials and access to these procedures for otherwise willingly informed presenting patients. Um, so furthermore, Medicare does not currently consider preventative surgeries such as BSO for BRCA positive patients necessary. And this coverage can often be denied and preclude surgeons from completing or offering these procedures due, due, due to concerns for reimbursements. So then at the system level, the interaction between individual institutions, their greater hospital system, and the government leads to a more complex means of obstruction to surgery. Many preventative surgeries as well as sterilization procedures are considered elective and therefore easily bumped, rescheduled, or canceled should an emergent need arise. Due to federal regulations, many patients with federal insurance, like I mentioned, require specific documentation precluding procedures that result in sterilization from occurring within various time periods. And many of us have experienced the headaches these policies incur while creating an inequitable environment for patients relying on the, their country, which is supposed to be supporting their health and prosperity. And as I mentioned, the cost of materials, particularly energy devices implemented during these surgeries has limited the ability of surgeons to perform them with comfort and ease. Perhaps most impactful though is the lack of many institutions of providing standards for approach to risk reducing gynecologic surgeries. So in 2011, the Kaiser Permanente Health System adopted a sweeping change to routinely provide salpingectomy as a form of permanent sterilization and at the time of benign hysterectomy. So within five years, they achieved near universal procedural completion rates for presenting patients, highlighting the importance of uniform standards for these procedures. And finally, as is the case 
for many women's cancers, underfunding for clinical trials and prospective research leads to delays in our understanding of the effects of these procedures, both on ovarian cancer prevention, but also the longevity and chronic health outcomes of those persons receiving them. What barriers exist then for, high, for women who are high risk for the development of ovarian cancer? And again, we can group these as patient, physician, and institutional factors that function as barriers to these surgeries. For many patients, even those who have gone through menopausal transition, a loss of fertility is perceived as a major drawback to salpingo oophorectomy. And this is challenging for some of us to grapple with, but highlights societal ties to female worth in relation to reproductive potential. In some qualitative interviews from Herman in 2018, symptoms of surgical menopause, lack of knowledge of the benefits and risks of hormonal replacement, and a lack of public awareness contributed to women's decisions to delay oophorectomy despite a high-risk genetic or familial history. So where, where was there Angelina Jolie? Why is breast cancer you know, sponsored by the NFL? High-risk women are in need of a shift of public mentality and as such, poor recognition and referral rates to genetic counseling predominates patient factors blocking risk-reducing surgery. So here you can see the recommendations from NCCN for genetic testing criteria. A few highlights include anyone with an epithelial ovarian carcinoma history should undergo genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer susceptibility genes. Patients with a personal history of breast cancer are diagnosed before the age of 45 or with a breast cancer history and another relative with a BRCA-related cancer, including breast, ovarian, or pancreatic. Additionally, in the advent of directed therapies against homologous recombination, recombinant deficient tumors, such as PARP inhibitors, genetic testing should be routinely utilized for cancer-directed therapy when indicated as well. So a lack of referral and completion of these genetic tests and, and genetic referral patterns then becomes a bottleneck, like I mentioned, for patients completing these surgeries and acts as a barrier for patients that don't even necessarily know that they're high risk, let alone that they could potentially be doing something to be proactive. So for many physicians, a lack of knowledge or awareness of these guidelines can preclude high-risk patients from necessary referrals. Failure to elicit a detailed family history as well as perceived cost and access to genetic testing may further prevent a physician from recommending a referral to high-risk genetic testing. Again, prejudice plays a role here as surveys of physicians and oncology demonstrate that Black and Hispanic white women are less likely to receive referrals to genetic um, counselors due to the perception that they will not complete these referrals despite their indication. And so recognition of barriers to completion of genetic counseling referrals and individualized plans for testing completion are needed to ensure that adequate understanding of the prevalence um, of some of these mutations is robust across diverse populations and diverse groups needing cancer and oncopreventative care. So again, a lack of institutional processes contributes to missed opportunities and unmet testing needs. Frequently teams tasked with recognizing and caring for patients with high-risk histories are fragmented across primary care, surgical specialties, and acute care services. Here at UW, we've been able to synergize these efforts in high-risk clinics such as a PASS clinic, allowing for integration and ease of access and understanding for patients presenting with a high-risk history. Similar efforts integrated across specialties aimed at prevention can further upscale utilization of risk-reducing surgeries as well. So perhaps even more critical for the high-risk population is access to specialty surgeons capable of completing risk-reducing procedures, but also recognizing and intervening on an occult malignancy. The incidence of occult ovarian cancer at the time of BSO for BRCA positive patients is estimated to be anywhere from five, between five and 10%. So access to surgeons capable of staging as well as pathologists and hypersectioning protocols designed for the identification of pre-invasive or microscopic lesions is critical to appropriate risk stratification and treatment delineation for these people. So then how do we improve? So here in what may still be considered the advent of risk-reducing gynecologic surgery, how do we address these access issues before they become full-fledged cancer disparities? And propose models target public awareness, a multidisciplinary approach 
and policy changes at the legislative and institutional levels. Public knowledge is largely influenced by peer experiences. Women undergoing salpingectomy and BSO seek insight from other women that have undergone these procedures. And thus the experience and in informed counseling is key to setting expectations. Again, Herman in 2018 demonstrated a lack of public attention from the media and policymakers as a main barrier to women with high-risk mutations completing a oophorectomy. So one interviewee reportedly said, it was very difficult to find anything that really was representative of me. Like I could pull things out of different articles, but there wasn't anything for the full-time student, single parent who didn't have private health insurance. And additionally, where patient and provider intent diverge, thus creates a space for education and interventions aimed at targeting the oncologic benefit of risk-reducing surgery. Um, and those interventions could find a home in closing this gap. So integration into other surgical specialties remains key to the continued implementation of risk-reducing gynecologic surgery. Opportunities at the time of abdominal pelvic surgery, including bariatric surgery, cholecystectomy, and hernia repairs, have demonstrated similar outcomes and favorable patient-reported experiences, suggesting a pathway for collaborative risk-reducing efforts. For many patients with high-risk mutations, the combined approach to risk-reducing mastectomy and bilateral salpingo oophorectomy has demonstrated a similar safety profile, significant cost savings, and satisfaction from patients as well. Clinics aimed at identifying surgical interventions for various risk-reducing indications are theorized to fill this need in a way that is economical and fair. But beyond the creation of this point, perhaps idealistic, you know, what could be called idealistic multidisciplinary clinics, educational opportunities for other surgical specialties arise in terms of recognition of patients who could benefit from or be interested in risk reduction without knowing that it's available to them. And finally, surgeons must function as champions of oncopreventative surgery, advocating for institutional standards and federal policy changes to create equitable access to risk-reducing surgeries. Changing cultures around the perception of risk reduction as elective is key and can be accomplished through formal institutional policies for scheduling and completion of these surgeries. The elimination of federal regulations regarding women's choices to no longer reproduce are necessary to tear down barriers, preventing women with federal insurance from experiencing delays and red tape keeping them from their desired procedures. Consistent advocacy is required to achieve expansion of reimbursement to include preventative surgeries for high-risk conditions. And so what do we not know? You know, there's still a lot that we really don't understand. Prospective evidence on salpingectomy is lacking and only observational at this point, despite its relatively massive adoption in academic centers. For some high-risk patients, BSO is not enough to prevent ovarian cancer. And many of these patients, you know, anywhere from one to 4%, depending on the study that you read, still develop an ovarian or primary peritoneal cancer, which really highlights our lack of understanding of the pathogenesis at this point. So in the setting of salpingectomy, we continue to investigate its long-term effects on ovarian endocrine function, as well as evaluating its relative efficacy as a form of contraception compared to other methods of sterilization. So ongoing randomized trials evaluating salpingectomy for high-risk patients with or without delayed oophorectomy continue to accrue and maturation of this data could better delineate the benefit of salpingectomy as a cervical, surgical intervention for high-risk patients wishing to avoid surgical menopause. Similarly, completion of hysterectomy for benign indications with or without self-injectomy continues to accrue prospective data in an attempt to understand how this affects patients with average background risk. And here I've listed some of those trials and their uh, registration numbers just for your reference in terms of where we're at with some of this data as well. So what can you do for self-injectomy? Well, it starts with emphasizing what we know and why we think this strategy reduces risk. Accomplishing this at the community level and engaging in ovarian cancer support groups or fundraisers, as well as advocating at the local, state, and federal level can raise awareness and draw public attention. Fostering cross-sectional or cross-departmental relationships through combined surgical in initiatives or preventative clinics 
can capture patients interested in optimizing their health through prevention and facilitate this process for them with ease. With that comes the need for standard protocols for completion and implementation of these procedures to ensure equitable receipt and access. And finally, in counseling patients regarding the removal of tissue to prevent cancer, we must consider the humanity in what we're asking and how that organ may make someone feel whole. It's easy for us as surgeons to see tissue for what it is, but we can often miss how that piece of a person contributes to their perspective of themselves as a human being. And so maintaining a sensitivity to what we're asking as a part of a greater good that often feels nebulous and not necessarily relevant to the person that we're discussing is key to establishing these relationships and establishing this as a viable method for preventing ovarian cancer and preventing cancer-related disparities. So with that, I'll stop. These are my references. Um, as far as acknowledgements go, I really want to thank Dr. Williams, Dr. Barrelet, and Dr. Gaston for helping to foster my interest in this topic and, and understanding what sort of materials and resources we have here at UW and, and what the landscape is for this in terms of risk reduction and prevention for women with average and back, high risk backgrounds, um, as well as helping me prepare for this talk. I'm very grateful. And then to my class, Alexa, John, and Jordan, and Daniel, and Vienna, and Ushma, I'm extremely grateful for all of the help in the last four years and you know, putting up with me in general. So thank you guys. I'll take some questions now. Great, great job, Matt. Um, just anyone who has any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask or write them in the chat here. There's lots of uh, positive feedback going on for you in the chat, if you can see that, Matt. Hey, Matt, it's Greg Bills. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for it. Um, is there any evidence or thought that fibroectomy would be as effective as salpingectomy for risk reduction? So there is a thought. I don't think that there is any evidence that it is as effective. I know that um, one of the trials that they're evaluating in Europe is trying to answer that specific question with fimbriectomy. And I think that's in a high risk population though. Um, but it's interesting because if you look at some of the data, the observational stuff seems to suggest that salpingectomy might be slightly better at this point, but there haven't been a lot of really great robust things looking at just distal salpingectomy or fimbriectomy, you know? And they don't know if that's related to the actual portion of the tube that's removed. Like, does the mutation and does that precursor start in the distal fallopian tube and that's why we should remove it? Or is it something that has to do with tubal occlusion? You know, like if we take out a portion of the tube and you don't have this sort of oxidative stress occurring at that junction of all of those various sort of embryologic structures that are sensitive to, you know, metaplasia and carcinogenesis, could that also be beneficial too? So long and short, no, but they, that is something that is specifically being evaluated in one of those RCTs. Thank you. Hey, Matt, it's Lisa Barrelet. That was just an extraordinary talk. Thank you. Um, you just uh, pointed out something very near and dear to me, which is the um, idea that oxidative stress has something to do with carcinogenesis, particularly in ovarian cancer. And to Dr. Bill's point, I do think that is a reason to remove the whole tube because we don't understand um, what is happening. It's not, it's more than, um, it's true that we see the first changes in terms of histopathology in the most distal part of the tube, but we do not understand the entire microenvironment and what those cellular stresses are doing related to proximity to the ovary. So I think right now, um, in light of our relatively limited understanding of carcinogenesis in general, um, there are reasons to think that taking out the whole tube is important. Uh, congratulations on this talk, Matt. Thank you. Hey Matt, I have a question for you. <clears throat> Since uh, your future fellowship program director did a great job recruiting you to fellowship, um, you have a really, you know, in, in the virtual room, you have the most knowledge of this topic now. And you also have some institutional insight because you've done some research uh, adjacent to this topic. Just wondering if 
uh, either now or the next few months, what you might do to consider how we here in our institution and, and those we impact in Wisconsin, what we might do to sort of move these issues forward and impact care positively for the patients we serve. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, from an institutional standpoint, there's a lot of things that either at Merit or at, at you, you know, the university hospital that we could work on in terms of how do we optimize ensuring that tubules, sterilization procedures that are desired are completed, especially how do we do that in the era of COVID now where so many of these procedures are getting put off? Can we develop protocols for that? Can we develop specific workflows working with the L&D teams here, working with the, the main OR teams? At UW, you know, in a lot of our clinics, we've, there's been an uh, initiative to start referring people to the multidisciplinary weight loss clinic and bariatric clinics. And so as we're starting to shift towards risk reduction around some of those surgeries, as we prepare for people having like benign hysterectomies or other sort of surgeries on that front, how do we integrate some of our knowledge and some of our awareness into those clinics? Are there any screening tools, which I couldn't find anything in terms of, you know, QI or or stuff like that, that has been implemented in other surgical specialties to say, are you someone who is interested or concerned about your risk of ovarian cancer? Would you like a referral to a gynecologist to talk about that? So things like that can happen here institutionally. I think in Madison specifically too, there is a level of apprehension regarding salpingectomy. And there is a certain subpopulation of people who, if you go through your whole spiel with them and you say, you know, our, our, recommendation at this point is to attempt salpingectomy if it's feasible. There's some people that would say, no, I just want part of my tube removed. I want, don't want you to take out the whole thing. And I think that that comes from a lot of different areas, but understanding where that comes from is going to be really key, at least for us here, but also as we go forward trying to implement this you know, on a larger scale, what are those patient motivations that diverge from our understanding of this as sort of a safe and preventative surgery that ultimately we see as being essentially equivocal to a lot of other tubal procedures. So those are things that I think that that's a sort of a jumping off point. There's obviously a lot of other things that, that we could work on or, or investigate. So I think there's some brilliance in Dr. Barlett commented on this too in the chat of seeing if we can develop clinical pathways that allow us to take literally three minutes for other procedures being done in the abdomen for women and seeing if they want to have a risk reducing or not risk reducing, if they want to have a prophylactic salpingectomy um, that you know does not change the, doesn't barely change any outcome of their case. It doesn't change um, the, the, how the case is coded as far as infection risk. And if you're just staring right at them, what does it take two minutes to take out tubes with a, mm -hmm. with a ligature? It's an interesting concept that we've not explored here, but could be, on a population level impactful. Well, I think a lot of people too, when, when you look at the patient reported outcomes from some of these like combined procedures or multidisciplinary clinics, a lot of patients report increased engagement and, and sort of a perception that their providers were more in tune with what was going on and what they actually you know, needed or could benefit. You know, To come into a clinic thinking that you're gonna have your gallbladder removed and then having someone say, hey, while we're doing this, what if we reduced your risk of developing cancer in the future? That's rapport building. And that's something that people you know, utilize to build trust. Um, and so from that standpoint too, I think if you could integrate that into those clinics, but then also at the community level, you would start to work on some of that sort of media publicity, et cetera, side of things to help with sort of the colloquial spread of information. I'm going to push back on you a little bit here, Matt. Okay. So, you know, I think as someone who does perform surgery, you know, for prophylactic purposes in a different place in the body, um, you know, surgery is just such a blunt tool to prevent cancer, right? It's like, it's there, we could, I, I hope in the future we have much better tools than just surgery to prevent cancers like this. Um, and I, there's something to me that um, is somewhat disturbing that, you know, women's bodies seems to be more, dis or parts of women's bodies seem to be more disposable um, than, you know, some of our, that's just seems to be the perception. Yes. Um, and, you know, no one is advocating for BRCA positive men to get their prostates removed 
prophylactically after they're done, you know, childbearing or anything like that, even though we know that they have more aggressive earlier prostate cancer um, that's more likely to be, you know, so, so, you know, there's something that's, that's a little, you know, I find a little um, challenging to think about in specifically in this kind of gendered way. Um, and the idea of just taking someone's tubes out when they're having another surgery, you know, we, America did that in the past and that did True. not go very well. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, was not very uh, well received or, um, you know, some did not help build trust, I would Correct. say, in the medical um, field. Um, and additionally, even in gynecology, the standard used to be when someone got a hysterectomy, you took their appendix out too, right? Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of, you know, older surgeons who that's how they trained. Um, and now we no longer do that um, as kind of a standard part, usually, of a hysterectomy. So. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And I think a lot of it has to do, like you mentioned, with like sort of how we place emphasis on like us, our society's like value of women and people who are female bodied. And I think that one, for me, that just harkens down to like our lack of knowledge, right? Like if we had the same level of funding that like some of these cancers that are often less lethal and affect men more predominantly, we might have a better understanding of why this is happening, where these lesions are coming from, how we could screen for them. I think that it highlights why these conversations need to be so nuanced and like why an adequate understanding of like what is the public perception, where is your patient population at and what is going on in those individual conversations is really important. Because I agree, I don't think you should like walk in and be like, oh, do you want your tubes out? Yes or no? Like it's a much more nuanced conversation than that. But I think that for many people and especially to me, it felt really salient in reading some of that literature about why women with BRCA or high, you know, breast and ovarian cancer syndromes in their family delay oophorectomy because they see that as like they're, they're no longer X or they're no longer Y. You know, Even if they're through menopause and they're not able to, to have children anymore, they still perceive that importance. And I think that that is like, you know, that's just the United States and our culture having problems. And so- it is interesting. I think that really it distills down to like a lack of the basic science and how that could be translated better. Um, so for now, it just more or less has to be, you know, really, really nuanced, sensitive conversations and community engagement to kind of overcome that. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're at time here, but uh, really excellent presentation this morning, Matt, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you.